Introduction to Statistics, Section 1.1, Statistical and Critical Thinking. The key concept of this section is that the process involved in conducting a statistical study consists of prepare, analyze, and conclude. Statistical thinking involves critical thinking and the ability to make sense of results. Statistical thinking demands so much more than the ability to execute complicated calculations. Here are some definitions. The first definition is data. We need data. In order to get data, it's a collections of observations such as measurements, genders, or survey responses. Statistics. This is the science of planning studies and experiments, obtaining data, and organizing, summarizing, presenting, analyzing, and interpreting those data, and then drawing conclusions based on them. Population. This is the complete collection of all measurements or data that are being considered. Typically, a population is the complete collection of data that we would like to make inferences about. Census. The collection of data from every member of a population. Sample. A sample is a subcollection of members selected from a population. Let's take a look at an example here. Example 1. Watch what you post online. In a survey of 410 human resource professionals, 148 of them said that job candidates were disqualified because of information found on social media postings. This was based on data from the Society of Human Resource Management. Now in this case, we want to identify the population and sample are as follows. Well, the population according to this would be all the human resource professionals. The sample is going to be the 410 human resource professionals who were surveyed. So this was the amount who was surveyed, but the population would be all of the human resource professionals. Now, the objective is to use the sample as a basis for drawing a conclusion about the population of all human resource professionals. And methods of statistics are helpful in drawing such conclusions. Now here is um, a list of statistical and critical thinking. The first thing you would do is prepare. So number one, you'd have the context. What do the data represent? What is the goal of the study? Number two, source of the data. Are the data from a source with a special interest so that there is pressure to obtain results that are favorable to the source. Sampling method. Were the data collected in a way that is unbiased or were the data collected in a way that is biased, such as a procedure in which respondents volunteer to participate? Now, once we prepare, now we need to analyze. Once we get the data, we would then graph the data. Number two, then we're going to explore the data. We want to ask ourselves, are there any outliers, which are numbers very far away from almost all of the other data? What important statistics summarize the data, such as we'll get to the mean and standard deviation when we get to chapter three? How are the data distributed? Are there missing data? Did many selected subjects refuse to respond? Then, you apply statistical methods, so you can use technology to obtain these results. Now, once you analyze and you move forward, then you want to be able to then form a conclusion. And this is where we want to be able to find the significance, meaning do the results have statistical significance or do the results have practical significance? Now, going back to this list, whenever we prepare, this is what we would actually do during the preparation stage. So, for example, let's say we want to collect shoe print lengths and heights of eight males. 
So we collect the data. You can see the first row represents the shoe print in centimeters and then the height in centimeters. Now the context is now going to tell us the following. Creating the table, it includes shoe print lengths and heights of eight males. Forensic scientists measure shoe print lengths at burglary scenes and other crime scenes in order to estimate the height of the criminal. The format of the table suggests the following goal. Determine whether there is a relationship between the shoe print lengths and the height of males. This goal suggests a reasonable hypothesis. Males with larger shoe print lengths tend to be taller. We are using data for males only because 84% of burglaries are committed by males. Now we need to find the source of the data. Where did the source of the data come from? Well, this data is in the tables, which are from data set 9, which is called foot and height in appendix B at the end of the textbook, where the source is identified. Now the source certainly appears to be reputable. Then we want the sampling method. Now the individuals were randomly selected, and because it was randomly selected, we can say that the sampling method appears to be sound. Now, another way of collecting a sample is a voluntary response sample or self-selected sample, which is one in which the respondents themselves decide whether to be included. The following types of polls are common examples of voluntary response samples. By their very nature, all are seriously flawed because we should not make conclusions about a population on the basis of samples with a strong possibility of bias. Internet polls, in which people online can decide whether to respond. Mail-in polls, in which people can decide whether to reply. Telephone call-in polls, in which newspaper, radio, or television announcements ask that you voluntarily call a special number to register your opinion. So let's take a look at an example two. Voluntary response sample. Now, the ABC television show Nightline asked viewers to call with their opinion about whether the United Nations headquarters should remain in the United States. Viewers then decide themselves whether to call with their opinions, and 67 percent of 186,000 respondents said that the United Nations should be moved out of the United States. Now, in a separate and independent survey, 500 respondents were randomly selected and surveyed, and 38% of this group wanted the United Nations to move, move out of the United States. Now, you can see that the two polls produced dramatically different results. Even though the Nightline poll involved 186,000 volunteer respondents, the much smaller poll of 500 randomly selected respondents is more likely to provide better results because of the far superior sampling method, meaning that in this case the first one was a voluntary response, which is you're going to have more bias, where in a separate and independent survey they were randomly selected, therefore it's removing the bias. Next we analyze our data. Now after completing our preparation by considering the context, the source, and the sampling method, we begin to analyze the data. So we want to be able to graph and explore. This is an analysis which should begin with appropriate graphs and explorations of the data. Then we apply statistical methods. A good statistical analysis does not require strong computational skills. A good statistical analysis does require using common sense and paying careful attention to sound statistical methods. Let's take a look at example three, analyzing the data. We're going to refer to the table below of body temperatures, which are in degrees Fahrenheit. Is there some meaningful way in which each body temperature recorded at 8 a.m. is matched with a 12 a.m. temperature. So here are five subjects. 8 a.m., there are the temperatures at 8 a.m., and there are the temperatures at 12 a.m. Well, there is a meaningful. It is. 
course in this case because each column of 8 a.m. and 12 a.m. temperatures is recorded from the same subject. So each pair is matched. So subject one had a temperature measured at 8 a.m. and then again at 12 a.m. and so on with each subject. Now once you've analyzed the data, now you want to conclude. And this is the final step in our statistical process which involves conclusions and we should develop an ability to distinguish between statistical significance and practical significance. Now statistical significance is achieved in a study if the likelihood of an event occurring by chance is 5% or less. You will see that quite often in this course about the 5% or less. Now getting 98 girls and 100 random births is statistically significant because such an extreme outcome is not likely to result from random chance. Now getting 52 girls in 100 births is not statistically significant because that event could easily occur with random chance. Caution. An outcome can be statistically significant and it may or may not be important. Don't associate statistical significance with importance. Practical significance. It is possible that some treatment or finding is effective, but common sense might suggest that the treatment or finding does not make enough of a difference to justify its use or to be practical. So let's take a look at example four, statistical significance versus practical significance. In a trial of weight loss programs, 21 subjects on the Atkins program lost an average or mean of 2.1 kilograms or 4.6 pounds after one year based on the data from the comparison of Atkins, Ornish, Weight Watchers, and Zone Diets for Weight Loss and Heart Disease Reduction by Dan Singer, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, Volume 93, Number 1. The results show that this loss is statistically significant and is not likely to occur by chance. However, many dieters believe that after following this diet for a year, a loss of only 2.1 kilograms is not worth the time, cost, and effort so that for these people this diet does not have practical significance. This example includes a small sample of only 21 subjects but with very large data sets, also called as big data. Statistically significant differences can often be found with very small differences. We should be careful to avoid the mistake of thinking that those small differences have practical significance. Analyzing data, and this is potential pitfalls. Misleading conclusions. When forming a conclusion based on a statistical analysis, we should make statements that are clear even to those who have no understanding of statistics and its terminology. Sample data reported instead of measured. When data collecting, excuse me, when collecting data from people, it is better to take measurements yourself instead of asking subjects to report the results. Loaded questions. If survey results are not warded carefully, the results of a study can be misleading. Order of questions. Sometimes survey questions are unintentionally loaded by the order of the items being considered. Non-response. A non-response occurs when someone either refuses to respond or is unavailable. Low response rates. If a survey has a low response rate, the reliability of the results decreases. In addition to having a smaller sample size, there is an increased likelihood of having a bias among those who do respond. Percentages. Some studies cite misleading percentages. Note that 100% of some quantity is all of it, but if there are references made to percentages that exceed 
such references are often not justified.